Hey guys, how's it going? Topic tonight of uh, 10 common aquarium pests. That first one on the list is my arch nemesis. I always get these things and they annoy me. I believe it's because I feed too much baby brine shrimp. Hydra is a soft-bodied polyp. These are one of the most ancient animal groups in evolutionary terms and includes corals, jellyfish, hydra, and mixozoans. A hydra has a tubular body with a sticky foot at one end and tentacles at the other. Um, the reason that we don't like these are because, like jellyfish, the tentacles sting cells and allow the hydra to immobilize prey, so they eat on small organisms such as cyclops, daphnia, brine shrimp, but they can also catch and eat small fish, shrimp, all that sort of stuff. Uh, so hydra just have basically a small white... Um, body and then they'll just have a number of tentacles off that they'll look like a small spider or something like that they're very tiny and you probably won't notice them until they're a cluster on your glass or on your heater so they're mostly accidentally introduced into the aquarium through adding plants so um, yeah it's a good idea to quarantine your plants before introducing them into the aquarium if you don't already have a hydra problem and hydra have no brain, no circulatory or respiratory system, not, nor do they even have muscles, but they do yeah, prey on little critters that you want to keep alive. So they're even capable of eating small adult fish. They just basically immobilize them and then they're at the whim of the hydra. Also, they asexually reproduce rapidly so they can split off and make a million out of one hydra, um, just like... Um, anything asexual, I guess. Although they generally stay in one spot, they are capable of uprooting themselves and just flowing off to another area. Um, some methods for controlling these guys are blue garamis, also known as three-spot garamis. They'll actually eat them. Paradise fish will eat them, and mollies will also eat hydra. Although, in my experience, the mollies didn't eat hydra, so it might be a bit of a... Um, a bit of a matter of actually not feeding these fish so that they have to have the hydra as a food source. And also pond snails will occasionally eat them as well. Uh, if you don't have the option of introducing any of those fish or snails, then you can use heat. Uh, so take out all your fish, crank the heat up to 40 Celsius, 104 Fahrenheit for two hours or so. And then after that, you just turn the heat back down to whatever the normal is. Do a gravel vac to remove any of the dead hydras and that can work. But, yeah, you'll probably melt your plants because, and you need to leave the plants in there. Otherwise, the hydra will be on the plants. So kind of it defeats the purpose. And then after that, do a big water change and stuff and um, should be okay. If neither of those are options, there are also plenty of planaria medicines um, that will work on hydra as well. So no planaria, planaria zero are good ones. I believe fenbendazole will work and also many of the anti-fluke medications um, such as Paragard. So that's Hydra, a real pest. Now, just as annoying as Hydra is the cousin. Planaria. Dun, dun, dun. Planaria are awful. So Planaria are a variety of flatworm, and these also can quickly multiply and be dangerous to a lot of members of your aquarium. Important to note, a single flatworm is a Planarian, and a group of flatworm are planaria. So let's say, for example, you found one of these, you decide to cut it up in half and that will kill it. Incorrect. It will actually grow two different planaria. So it's a bad idea to crush planaria if you find it in your aquarium. Firstly, you do want to make sure that it's actually a planaria you're dealing with because there are lots of different flatworms and stuff like that. Planaria are usually very, very tiny, uh, 0 0.1 to 0 0.6 inches, you know, which is like, very very small so let's do some quick math on that um it's like five millimeters tops so they're really easy to miss in fact you'll most likely not notice them until they have grown into quite big numbers but a good way to check on these is go and have a look at your aquarium at night when the lights are off and uh, you might notice these white things crawling along your glass or go in right before your lights turn on and then you'll notice them all run into the substrate not run 
slither or whatever whatever it's called go down into the substrate um so there's two main types of planarians planarians planaria that are commonly found in aquariums white planaria or procotilla or black and brown planaria which is dugesia to make things more confusing, some types of planaria can also change color depending on what they eat. So if you feed color enhancing flakes, you can get a pink planaria, something like that. But besides the color, they are nearly identical in appearance. So what you want to look out for is actually the shape. Um, so they will have a flat worm body. They're flat. You know, they're not called a flat worm because they're really round. But um, the main distinguishing feature about planaria is the arrow head that they have. So look for an arrow at the end and you'll be fairly sure that it's a planaria. You probably got it from your local fish store on plants once again. They're really great hitchhikers and they will they can actually hide in rocks, plants and even attach themselves to fish. So there's not a lot you can do to try and avoid planaria other than strict quarantine. But even if you do, they might still be on the fish and you know what happens there. Um, so black and brown planaria feast mainly on waste biofilm poop and uneaten fish food, so it's not too bad. But um, white planaria eat worm shrimp and live food such as Daphne or bloodworms. So if your tank has a lot of that sort of protein, carnivorous type food, then you'll see a lot of white planaria. Black and brown planaria and white planaria are all dangerous though in their own way. So white planaria will be aggressive predators and hunt down shrimp and things like that. Um, and even adult shrimp, where brown and black planaria don't hunt the shrimp, but they move on a slime trail, and that slime trail has a toxin that is deadly to the shrimp. So both of them, bad news for shrimp. If the slime touches the belly of the shrimp, or if the planaria crawl under the exoskeleton of the shrimp, it will stun them, and then the planaria will just eat it alive, basically. Good, good stuff. So luckily, if you're in the States, you can use fenbendazole to get rid of planaria. In Australia or areas where fenbendazole is not as widely available, uh, you can use planaria zero or no planaria, which is basically a natural beetle nut extract. You can also use uh, traps, which I've got videos on how to make them. However, I would just use caution with this because... There's a few reasons. First of all, we know that they can asexually reproduce and a trap might miss some. So you might actually just be delaying the problem. It can depend on the bait. Um, in my particular situation, the bait that I used wasn't all overly successful. And yeah, I think overall the chemical means is better, but it is quite expensive. So maybe if you can't afford the chemical immediately, you could throw a trap in, which I think I said in that video. So that's planaria. So the next one here is limpets. Ever seen a limpet before? A limpet is an aquatic pulmonate gastropod, meaning that they are air-breathing freshwater animals, and they're in the same family as slugs and snails. Freshwater limpets um, are clean-up artists. They eat slime, fungus, decaying vegetable matter, and um, animal waste or fish waste. They are not a threat to any healthy plant, nor to any fish, fry, or shrimp. They're good. Main reason people don't like them is that they're unsightly. Uh, the best option to avoid these is to quarantine your plants, not bring them in, or to remove livestock and dose snail chemicals to remove them. Loaches, assassin snails, etc., which are common predators for snails, they're less effective on limpets because limpets have a very low profile and a lot of fish find it difficult to get underneath the shell to actually predate on them. Yeah, so limpets are a small, round. They kind of look like a cluster of snail eggs, like a clear sort of being, and they have, yeah, quite a low profile and, and, a, and a hard shell exterior. So certainly related to snails, and they will climb all over your glass. Next one on the list we might have seen early days in our fishkeeping hobby. These are detritus worms. Uh, these are annelid worms that includes uh, earthworms and leeches. They're thin, pointy, white, brown strings that wiggle through the water and between the gravel. Detritus worms are detritivores, uh, hence the name, meaning that they only eat decomposing plant and animal waste material. They will not harm fish or anything like that. 
It's not uncommon for an aquarium to have detritus worms as they can be introduced through a variety of means. For instance, they may have come in with a new fish or plant. They may have been present in gravel from another tank. Um, And quite often detritus worms are not even ever seen. They tend to live in the gravel where they eat the debris left over um, from feeding or deposited by fish. You'll probably only notice them when you get doing a gravel vac and you might disturb them or if you, you know, scoop out the gravel or the soil from a tank, you might notice them. Detritus worms may actually be very beneficial and form a symbiotic relationship with your tank system as they help to keep it clean. When you see detritus worms overpopulating, it is important to not treat them with dewormers or any medications because they will not take take care of the problem and they might cause a bit of an ammonia spike with all the dead worms in the tank. Overabundance of these worms can occur when tank maintenance has been lacking, so insufficient cleaning or overfeeding of fish can cause detritus worms to rapidly reproduce and get out of control. Uh, Worm removal is best done by giving your tank a thorough cleaning. Use a gravel vac and change the water to remove majority of detritus worms and also their food sources. Secondly, be sure to check your filtration for any issues. Give it a clean. Maybe give it a week, though, before you do a gravel vac between cleaning your filter, just so you don't disturb too much of the bacteria that lives in both of those things. Going forward, be sure to regularly clean substrate, review your feeding practice, and make sure that your tank is not overstocked. A lot of people also refer to them as free food. This is a dragonfly larvae. larvae. Also, in the same family are damselfly larvae, larvae, whichever way you want to pronounce it. Okay, so all dragonfly nymphs are fierce and voracious predators. They will kill and eat anything, including shrimp and fish. And once they're in your aquarium, they will start hunting nonstop until you deal with them. And in some cases, they might even force you to drain everything down and restart the whole aquarium. These guys you do not want in your fish room. When dragonflies hatch, uh, they are called nymphs, and dragonfly nymphs are these things on the on the screen here. Or if you're w- listening to the podcast, they look like hmm, like a small insect, basically a dragonfly without wings. And um, they molt up to 12 to 17 times, and they can spend as long as four to five years as nymphs. So nymphs are the ones that are, we, we need to worry about because they are the ones that are you know, aquatic. During the nymph stage, they are very elusive and dragonfly nymphs can survive months in the aquarium without detection. In most cases, the first time people find out about them is when the population of shrimp or fish colonies start decreasing without any obvious reason. Damselfly nymphs are similar, but they are smaller and more slender compared to dragonflies. Damselflies' gills are located at the end of the abdomen, the head is wider than the thorax and the abdomen, and damselfly nymphs swim by undulating their body. They are not the best fish hunters, although shrimp will be in danger. And dragonfly nymphs are much more predatory, bigger. They're a, a real threat to shrimp, fish, snails, everything, and they look quite different. Dragonfly nymphs are bulkier and more stout. In addition, they have gills at the base of their rectum, and they breathe through their bottom, which is fitting because they're real (laughs) holes. Dragonfly nymphs pull water into their rectums to breathe. When the hungry nymph is on the rampage, this vent turns into a jet, and rapid contractions force water backwards and propel the nymph forwards. Unfortunately, they are very hardy. Almost everything that can kill them will also kill shrimp and fish. Some shrimp and fish breeders say that this is the war that you cannot win and thus they advise restarting the tank and wiping out everything. The best way to kill them is to grab them with a net and remove them if you see them. You can do gravel vax and suction them out with a siphon. A safer and more gentle alternative may be to let plants sit in a covered container with no water. Many plants can survive immersed grain. And the dragonflies need water to breathe, so they will move to the base of the plant and then the container in search of water, but this doesn't work against the eggs. 
If you do not have shrimp and snails in the tank, you can dose copper or you can gas them with a lot of CO2 to decrease the level of oxygen in the tank. These guys are mosquito larvae, mosquito larvae, and they stay in the larvae larval form for 5 to 14 days. Most fish will happily chow down on them. Um, they're a great live food to sort of culture if you want to do it outside. Um, the best way to catch them is use a brine shrimp net, turkey baster, or a reusable coffee strainer and feed them to other fish. They do have a bit of a unique wiggling pattern. Um, they'll sort of look a bit like hmm, they're having sort of an epileptic moment and they'll just burst wiggle around. They're not a real threat unless they survive past that larval stage and then they become quite annoying when they become mosquitoes. Um, for people who are listening, they look like, hmm, what do they look like? Yeah, just look kind of like a little sm small worm, maybe like a one centimeter or um, point two, uh, oh geez, one centimeter or half an inch or so little worm and it just does a squiggling sort of movement on the top of the water surface um, and yeah not a threat just catch them out and feed them to fish mainly it's just if they're in shrimp tanks and things where they have no natural predators but yeah a lot of people culture these outside and they're a great free natural food source all right so next one on the list is cyclops um, cyclops are tiny copepods little crustaceans that are found in many freshwater and saltwater bodies, um, they derive their name from a single eye located in the middle of their head. Another name is water fleas due to their resemblance of young cyclops to fleas found on land. They are often found in the same location as Daphne are, and they congregate in heavily they congregate heavily in still areas of water that have algae growth. Uh, occasionally, because cyclops can get quite large, up to five millimeters. Um, so they can snack on weak, tiny newborn fry. So just, yeah, if you're going to feed cyclops, just wait until they're a little bit bigger first. And, uh, yeah, they make a great uh, high-quality protein food for adult fish and anything that's going to be able to eat it. These ones are seed shrimp. Yeah. Sea shrimp are also filter feeders. They use their little antennae to filter and search for food. They live on organic detritus and algae. Sea shrimp form part of the food chain for other invertebrates and juvenile fish. They can be described as small crustaceans, typically round or egg-shaped, and they vary in size from 0.2 to 1 millimeter. Sea uh, shrimp are a benefit to the aquarium because they're very small size and their eating habits meet mean that they are one of nature's best cleanup crews for shrimp keeper aquariums and many people encourage them to thrive in tanks and there's a belief that they are an indicator in their tank that their water parameters are healthy so I believe they're called seed shrimp because of their resemblance to a small seed like a sesame seed I guess or like a mini clam they have sort of two shells on either side they look like a little clam and these are great natural foods for lots of different fry numero nine oh daphnia uh, tiny plankton like freshwater crustaceans they grow to about three millimeters in length or less they far prefer living at the top of the surface of water especially juveniles and babies as for water temperature you want to keep it quite cool around 20 degrees Celsius or 68 Fahrenheit. Uh, Daphnia are photosen photosensitive, like baby brine shrimp, so they will swim towards the light, and that makes it very convenient for catching them and using them as a food source for fish. Uh, these guys are the freshwater sponge. Uh, freshwater sponges are delicate in structure. They grow on branches and masses by encrusting themselves, they usually appear greenish because of algae and stuff that lives on them. Uh, they attach themselves to ro rocks, logs, and filter the water for small organisms, protozoans, bacteria, and other free-floating algae. Unlike marine sponges, freshwater sponges are exposed to far more adverse and variable conditions, 
So they have developed a form of dormancy. And when they're exposed to excessive cold or other harsh situations, they basically retreat into a bud-like form. They go dormant. And then when conditions improve, they germinate and a new sponge is born. Many people consider them as a sign of a really healthy aquarium and they are no harm to any inhabitants. So it's pure bonus if you get a freshwater sponge. Pat on the back because you're doing a good job and they're going to help filter your water. So happy days if you get a freshwater sponge. Leeches. Uh, not unlike Planaria and Hydra, leeches can end up in your a tank alongside privately traded submersed aquatic plants. Other parts like pre-owned aquarium equipment, decorations and substrate are also possibilities. So to control them, you want to quarantine newly acquired aquarium plants and animals um, and pre-owned technology and decorations. So disinfect them and, yeah, just strict quarantine. They can be pretty easily identified by their build. They kind of look like a drop shape, like a teardrop or a spoon shape or, you know, that sort of narrow at one end, rounder in the middle, and then narrow again at the other end. From species to species, uh, leeches can vary in color from reddish brown to green and also white. They can reach a length of up to three centimeters. Mostly they live hidden in substrate or on stones and plant leaves. Snail leeches live predatorily off worms and snails, and the movement of some most leeches resembles that of a caterpillar, sort of slink along, basically suction the front end, let the back end catch up, suction that, let the front end in forward and so on and so forth. Typical worm killers do not work against leeches, although preparations that contain copper are toxic to them. Unfortunately, that will also finish off most invertebrates, crabs, shrimps, snails, etc. Pond snails, they come in from live plants typically. They populate, uh, they populate to the amount of additional food that's in the aquarium. So basically if you do heavy overfeeding, you'll have a big population of pond snails. If you don't overfeed, you'll have next to no pond snails. They're a good indicator, I believe, for beginners to know how much they should be feeding their aquarium, just judging by that. I reckon it's a great natural way to, to basically tell people how much to feed. If you want to get rid of them, you can introduce assassin snails, but, um, you know, introducing a snail to get rid of a snail. But assassin snails do look kind of cool. Uh, although they are illegal in lots of parts of Australia, you can use copper. Also, you can use loaches, which eat them. Um, puffers are another alternative as well. So pond snails are pretty common if you get live plants. And um, best way to not have these is to quarantine your plants. You can do like a dip. Um, to kill off them from, yeah, before you introduce the plants into your aquarium. Or you can just leave, you could even just do a dip and then sit the plants in a separate aquarium or bucket until you're sure that there's certainly no snails on the plants or eggs. So that's the topic tonight of uh, 10 common aquarium pests that kind of pop up. As we did go through, not all of them actually detrimental to the aquarium. Some of them can actually be beneficial. So if you do see some little critters bouncing around in your tank, don't panic. Um, maybe just, yeah, make sure you know exactly what it is before you determine your course of action. And in many cases, you might actually decide to keep them around. So hopefully you enjoyed this topic. If you did enjoy it, tune in next week for the next edition of Blake's Live Bites. And I'll catch you on the next one. Mm-hmm. <laughs>